just one place for me near you. It's like heaven to be near you. Times when we're apart, I can't. Nobody thought too much of it. It was on the B side of the record, and uh, a radio station in Georgia started playing it. It just took off, and that really puts Nashville on the map. It's kind of forgotten today, but it puts, you know, here's a million seller coming out of Nashville in a Nashville studio with a Nashville-based independent label. Nashville may be famous for its country music hits, but that's not the kind of hit that got the recording industry started here. Don Cusick, a professor of music history, traces it back to a big band song called Near You, a song you've probably been hearing without even realizing it. The Sunday in December, I'll never forget it. My next door neighbor and I were jitterbugging in his big old wide hall, and we were aware that all of his brothers and sisters and mother and daddy were in the living room just listening to the radio, and all of a sudden it was very quiet. So we stopped our jitterbugging, and we learned that we were in war. At 94 years old, Mary B. Williams has enough memories to fill a book, including growing up in East Nashville, adapting her life to war, working in early television, and confronting Jim Crow laws. You'll hear these stories and a lot more on this episode of Nashville Retrospect. Welcome to the Nashville Retrospect Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Forkham. I am also the editor and publisher of the Nashville Retrospect, a monthly newspaper full of old news stories from and new essays about Nashville's past. This is the last episode of our first year. We're grateful to everyone who has supported this podcast, whether it was through donations or by recommendations to friends and families or by sharing it on social media. We ask that you continue supporting us. We hope to be back soon with more episodes. Follow us on Facebook for the latest news. In the meantime, you can find plenty of fascinating and enlightening stories from the city's past in the Nashville Retrospect newspaper. In the March 2019 issue, you can read articles from the year 1919, when thousands of Nashvillians welcomed home Tennessee soldiers from Europe after the end of the Great War. The celebrations started in Centennial Park where the soldiers had gotten off trains at a nearby depot. An 1809 article recounts the death of Daniel Boone, claiming that he was found stiff and cold with his rifle aimed at a salt lick, his finger on the trigger, and one eye open, looking down the barrel. In 1979, the assistant district attorney in Nashville had a restraining order placed on two homosexual films at an adult theater, declaring that they, quote, breed perversion, The films were to be used as evidence in an obscenity case. Vanderbilt University's first women's basketball team played their inaugural game in 1897, beating Ward Belmont 5-0. Men weren't allowed to watch this game, but a newspaper reporter managed to sneak in. And there's lots more. An 1883 Masonic Theater program, the Fisk Jubilee Singers in 1966, the Cloverbottom Massacre in 1870, and Dinah Shore in Nashville, her former home, in 1941. To see article excerpts and photographs from some of these and other stories, visit our Facebook page. You can pick up the latest issue of The Retrospect for only a dollar at local grocery stores and markets. And at NashvilleRetrospect.com, you can order subscriptions and even back issues. And don't forget, you can order gift subscriptions, too. Mary Binkley Williams is a native Nashvillian from way back. At 94 years old, she has collected quite a few stories of Nashville. She recently sat down with me in her Green Hills home to revisit a few of them. I grew up in East Nashville. All the streets downtown were 
of course, very familiar to me. And back in my day, since I am 94, back when I was a young girl, very young, actually, my father was uh, supervisor of the county schools, and uh, my mother taught in the city. And I was able to go. Daddy's uh, office was in the old courthouse where the one in 1936 was built, still, of course, stands. And it was at that time in our history in Nashville that I was safe enough that I could go down and visit my daddy and I could leave the courthouse and walk up to Kane Sloan's, which was one of our oldest department stores in Nashville on Fifth Avenue and Church Street. And I think about that today, that how you would never allow your child today to leave at that tender age and walk that distance downtown. How did you get from Russell Street to the public square? The streetcar. <laughs> I, uh, with, um, I remember the streetcars well before the buses came into Nashville. But we lived in the 1500 block of Russell Street. And I walked, we lived, the back of our house was on an alley. And the alley was transportation out. <laughs> uh, this is where all of the, the people who serviced the homes back then, like the ice man, the trash man, uh, they all came through the alley. And also, when I went to catch the, uh, get on the streetcar, I walked down the alley over two blocks and got on the streetcar and went downtown. And then later, uh, when streetcars were obsolete, then my dad drove us downtown. And my mother uh, went often because she had her hair salon in, was at the Hermitage Hotel on the mezzanine. So he drove us downtown and she had her hair done. And I sat in one of the big old comfortable chairs and took a book and read while Daddy had a shoe shine, got a shoe shine. And uh, those memories were very special to me. I asked Mrs. Williams if there were any businesses in East Nashville that stood out in her memories. Now, we lived, um, like I say, on the 1500, in the 1500 block of Russell. And at the corner of our street, there was Parsons Grocery. And that's where we bought all of our food, was at Parsons Grocery. And I can remember so many days of Mother saying, I think I'm going to have a little luncheon today and go up to that Parsons store and get it. Then she sent me up there one day to pick up um, a few things, and one was a can of tomatoes. And I got that can of tomatoes, and I looked at them, and it wasn't this silly. They had a big dent in the can. And I thought, oh, Mother's going to make me take that back. I'll just hide it behind the store and tell her they didn't have it. <laughs> so I came home and gave her the groceries, and she said, well, what about tomatoes? And I said, they didn't have any tomatoes. <laughs> and she called Mr. Parsons. Oh, me. So she sent me back to get the tomatoes. But anyway, Parsons' store was just, oh, my land. It was just, you know, part of our life. Mary Binkley grew up in a mixed religious family, part Methodist, part Church of Christ. She and her brother Joe were split between the two, at least until the young Mary had a religious conversion of sorts. I went with my daddy to the Methodist Church, the wonderful historic church in, on Holly Street in East Nashville, well over 100 years old now. Love that church with passion. I really do. But, uh, and I have taken my friends there. But I was a little girl, and uh, Joe went with my mother to the Church of Christ, and I went with Daddy. Mother didn't drive, so Daddy uh, would drop Mother off at Chapel Avenue Church of Christ, and he and I would go to his church and my church until he would pick up his friends to go to the church, and I was in the car. They all smoked cigars. And they made me sick. That cigar smoke made me sick. And it was a cold day. 
and the windows were up in the car. And I knew that I would be sick by the time I got to the Methodist church that day when he, after he picked up, let mother and daddy, mother and Joe off. So I said, Daddy, I'm gonna go with mother today. So Daddy always told people that I became a Camelite because of his cronies <laughs> smoking cigars. Another East Nashville location enjoyed by Mary was Shelby Park, but it also happened to be here that she first became aware of Jim Crow laws. Shelby Park was a big part of my life. I'm talking a big part of my life. Daddy was the one in the neighborhood that brought all the children together and would take us to Shelby Park on Saturday night. They had a free movie. Uh, He would take us during the summer to the playground. That's where I got my first experience with what I despised, the segregation of the blacks and the whites. And I do have two stories where I, well, as my daddy was afraid I was going to get arrested when I got older, where I just, I couldn't stand it. I just couldn't stand it. But that's where I met a little girl that was an African-American child that was on the merry-go-round with me. And it was a hot day and uh, we were thirsty. And um, there was a sidewalk where you left the playground that you walked up and there was a fountain up there. And the little girl and I, don't remember her name, but we both held hands, walked up that walk to the fountain. And she said to me, I can't drink out of that fountain. And I said, what do you mean you can't drink? I said, I didn't know, I was so young, I didn't know. And she said, "Uh, I have to go to the one that says colored. That's when it, that was my first encounter with this terrible, terrible segregation. And I said, I can remember it well. I was so angry. And I said, yes, you can drink out of this fountain. And she said something to the effect she was afraid she'd get in trouble. And I said, I'll tell my mother. You're not going to get in trouble. So she drank out of the fountain. And we came back, and I was so angry and I was talking real loud, and Mother kept shushing me. She said, we'll talk about it when we get home. So when we got home, I wanted, I wanted an explanation. What is this? What do you mean? She tried to explain it, but I never felt good about it. And forever, my whole life, I would have been on that freedom ride if it hadn't been for my husband. <laughs> I'm sorry. But that has been a really sore spot with me. It really has. And you said there was another incident? Oh, yeah. It was not good. <laughs> I was on the streetcar. And I was just maybe 15, maybe 14. I don't know. I was young. And all the seats, I was sitting on the long seat up front on the streetcar. All the seats were filled, of course, the colored in the back and the whites in front. And we stopped in this very pregnant young woman, uh, African-American, got on. I kept thinking as she walked past me to the back of the streetcar that surely one of the men back there would get up and give her a seat and they didn't. And the streetcars were kind of, you know, they, they, they kind of swerved. I don't know, I can't describe it exactly, but they weren't a real smooth ride. And at one point, there was kind of a jolt, and I saw her reach up to hold the strap. And some way or another, it came over me. I just, I was up and in her face before I knew it. And I just said, look, I'm afraid you're going to fall. Come up here and sit on my seat. 
And she said, I can't do that. I said, oh, yes, you can. Well, I was about halfway up with her where you could see the faces of the people on the, which made me even angrier. And then the guy driving the <laughs> streetcar stopped the streetcar and came to me and said, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, you can't do this. I said, oh, yes, I can. I said, do you know that this woman could have this baby any time? What are you going to do? I said, at least let her sit down. And nobody got up and gave her a seat. And I said, yes, she's going to sit down in my seat. And I said, if you have any problem with it, let me give you my daddy's address. And I told him the courthouse, and I played up this man that had a lot of influence in Nashville, which he didn't. But I mean, you know, but that's, I left him with that. And I said, just let her ride until she, I will stand by her. Let her ride to her place to get off. And I will get off at the end of the ride and call my daddy. And that's what I did. And daddy came and got me. <laughs> he said, I told him what happened. He said, I'm going to tell you, you have got to stop this. I had done other things before that. He said, uh, you're going to get arrested. I said, well, it's all so wrong. I can't stand it. I can't sit there and watch it. He said, uh, law's the law. You've got to abide by the law. But I saw a twinkle in his eye. <laughs> Mary's father was a big influence on her life, and he would help her out of a few tight spots over the years. One of them involved a high school dance at the Hermitage Hotel. At one point, I was dating a real good-looking boy, and he had just come to Nashville, and all the girls were just clamoring over him, and everybody was hoping to get his attention, and lo and behold, he invited me. He was in a fraternity, and he invited me to go to the uh, fraternity dance there at the hotel in that beautiful ballroom. Well, I was tall. Uh, I got my height early, and this young man was about my height. And I went upstairs to my bedroom and got out my new evening dress, which I'll never forget. It was beautiful. And I put it on, and then I went to get my shoes, which were very high heels. And back then, you had your shoes dyed to match your dress. So they were aqua to match my dress. And I put them on, and all of a sudden, I thought, Oh, my goodness, I'm going to be taller than my date. So I thought, what can I do? I have to have the shoes that match my dress. So I went downstairs and got my dad's um, toolbox. And I took it back. And I guess they were wire pliers or what. But anyway, I pulled those heels off of those shoes, never dreaming that the nails would stay intact. So here I was with a ruined pair of shoes, unless I could get the nails out, which I couldn't. So I had to go downstairs to my dad, and I took the toolbox and the shoes. And Daddy was not a tall man himself, and I think he understood. I just handed them to him, and I said, fix it. Please fix it. I'm going to look taller than my date. And he laughed, and he got those nails out. And I put those shoes on, and I don't know whether you've had the experience of wearing a pair of high heel shoes that you've removed the heels, but it's a very awkward walk. And as I walked out the door very awkwardly when my date came to pick me up, I heard my daddy chuckling. But you know, after I got, after I got to the ball, after I walked in, oh my goodness, Francis Craig was the leading orchestra uh, in Nashville, and they were playing, and all of the beautiful flowers and all the beautiful people dressed in their finery. I forgot. I forgot about my shoes. Oh, my goodness. I danced the night away, and I'll never forget that evening. It was one of the most special evenings that I had at the Hermitage, but I had many others. 
The Hermitage, Nashville's first million-dollar hotel, opened in 1910. Mrs. Williams has so many memories of the Hermitage, she has recounted many of them to the hotel's historian, Tom Vickstrom. I started going there when I was a child. In fact, I was four years old when my daddy's brother, who was an attorney in Louisville, Kentucky, came to Nashville frequently. And he always stayed at the Hermitage Hotel. And when he would invite my mother and daddy, he also invited my brother and me, Joe Binkley, and who became a lawyer in Nashville. And when we were children, we went to the Hermitage and had dinner at that wonderful dining room, which today I still frequent. And the hotel has just become, all through the years, something that is more special than anything in downtown Nashville. Uh, Not only did my sorority meet there on Saturday mornings, I went there with friends for lunch. I enjoyed the hotel in many ways. And then, of course, all of that life was over. World War II caused a major shift in history, ending the lives of millions of people and forever changing the lives of survivors. Mrs. Williams remembers the moment that change began for most Americans on December 7, 1941. The Sunday in December, I'll never forget it. My next-door neighbor and I were jitterbugging in his big old wide hall. They lived next door all of my life, the Davis family. And we were aware that all of his brothers and sisters and mother and daddy were in the living room just listening to the radio, talking very loudly and just, you know, everything going normally. And all of a sudden it was very quiet. So we stopped our jitterbugging and we learned that we were in war. War had been declared by President Roosevelt. And so all that lifestyle was over for many years for me. Because, you know, unless you, actually, unless you had lived as a teenager during that period in our history, you would never understand. You could never feel what we all felt at that time. One effect on teenagers was to rush them into maturity. For many young men, this meant joining the military. For many young women, it meant marriage. Everybody was afraid that there would be no future. What does the future hold? It was a big question. The boys wanted, I mean, they were going to be shipped out of here. They didn't know what life was going to be or if there would be a life. And they wanted to marry. It was just the most unusual feeling among the young people in Nashville. It was almost like panic. We've got to live life quickly. Well, I didn't, I had already, my parents had already planned for me to go to George Peabody College for teachers, and I was very willing to do that. I was looking forward to it. But it so happened that this young man (laughs) that I was dating, five years older, went into officer's training school and became a, came out as a second lieutenant. Um... I admired him greatly. By this time, I saw the maturity that I had not seen in my wonderful friends all through high school. It was just a different feeling altogether. And after I met him, I was still dating other boys, and I, everything was fine. Everybody knew what, you know, that was very acceptable. But then when he had a short leave, not really a leave. He was sent to Maryland from officer's training school and came through Nashville, could not leave the old train station, but I could go down at 2 o'clock in the morning and see him. Well, I'll have to admit that before he left to go to officer's training school, he gave me a ring, which I didn't wear. My daddy just panicked And (laughs) I didn't wear the ring, and I told him. I quoted my daddy. 
it's not appropriate to marry at this time in my life. I am 18 years old. Uh, <laughs> I need to get an education. Uh, it's a terrible thing to marry now because what if, what if you don't come back? What if I'm left? I have no education. And as my daddy said, what are you going to do at that point? Are you going to work at a five and ten cent store? So I played my case. But when he came through that union station and got off, keep in mind, he was a good-looking man. <laughs> and when he got off that train in the union station, as in Gone with the Wind, I had the vapors. <laughs> and... And at that moment, that evening, as we sat there in the Union Station, he again proposed. And I still stood by what my father wanted me to do, but I couldn't get it all off my mind. When very shortly after that, he sent me a letter, and he also sent a recording, and he stated that he had a leave, would come to Nashville, and he wanted us to marry when he came to Nashville. Well, I did. And my daddy was very upset. Now, my mother was okay. She, she was okay. She was easy, and, and mother was, we were very compatible and congenial, and she saw through everything, and she really liked the young man. I would never have thought of marrying at 18, except for the war, except for the circumstances. We, uh, we married at um, West End Methodist Church in the chapel. The chapel, of course, all my friends were gone. The boys were gone. My brother was gone. Uh, all my friends that would have been in the wedding, uh, of course, the girls were here, but well, no, no, my three best, two best friends weren't here. They were with their husband in some small town somewhere. But we had a beautiful wedding. We did. In two weeks, we, my mother and I got it together. And our wedding dinner was held at the Hermitage Hotel. And we spent the evening in the, that evening. That was our honeymoon. <laughs> that was the extent of it because the next morning, uh, we had the wedding suite, which was just beautiful. And when we left there the next morning, we went to the Union Station, got on the train, and uh, went to Langley Field, Virginia. And my whole life changed immediately. Mr. and Mrs. Thurman P. Williams started their family in Virginia with the birth of their first child, Charlie while Mary was still 18 years old and before they moved back to Nashville. The war and marriage had precluded Mary from pursuing the college education her parents wanted for her. But, except for wanting more children, Mrs. Williams was happy with being a mother and a housewife. I didn't intend to work, ever. You know, back then, uh, women didn't have jobs like they do today. Uh, it was more usual that when you married, you were a homemaker. And I knew that I had married a man that would make a good living for me, and I had no intentions of ever having a job. All I wanted to do was to be a mother and a homemaker. And I thought that's really what I was destined to be. But it was kind of a strange thing that happened Mother and I had been uh, shopping, and she had been invited to a, an affair that my daddy was attending as supervisor of the schools, and I wanted her to look her best. So we went shopping downtown, and this is at the oldest uh, women's shop in Nashville, which was Tinsley's very fashionable shop. It was where the cheeks, all of the elite in Nashville, <laughs> which we weren't, but that's where the elite in Nashville shopped was Tinsley's, and we were very aware of that fact. 
And this guy came over to me, and he said, uh, I noticed he was watching me, and I wondered why. And he said, have you ever modeled? And I said, well, yeah, I did. I did as a, in high school, just here and there. I said, not professionally at all, just at the department stores and, you know, different places around town, like the Rotary Club or something like that. But I said, I, I'm not a professional model at all. And he said, well, would you be interested in modeling for me? He was a designer from New York. And he had brought his clothes to Tinsley's to show. And he said, I need a model. And he said, I brought a model with me from New York, but I'd rather have a nice villain. And he said, she could teach you. She can show you really more professionally. And I thought, I had, Charlie was two, I think. And I thought, I can't do that. We were living with mother and daddy and, you know. So at the supper table that night, I brought it up. And I just told him what had happened. And daddy said, he called me Sugar all his life. He said, oh, Sugar, I think you ought to do that. He said, uh, mother will help you. And uh, mother was substituting then. She said, oh, yeah, I could. She said, I, I, I'll keep the baby. And... Uh, she said, do it. And I thought, now what's my husband going to say? <laughs> but he said, well, if you really want to do it, go ahead and do it. So I lit out Tinsley's and modeled Four Seasons. Modeling would eventually lead Mrs. Williams to her second career. Television was first broadcast in Nashville by WSM-TV in the fall of 1950. It would be a few years before video recordings could be made, so local programs were performed live in front of the cameras, even the commercials. Being on staff at WSM-TV, Mrs. Williams eventually began working on food commercials, which posed a few challenges. It was a new thing in Nashville. It had not been done, and it was trial and error. It just was. But the food companies like Newhoff, Jersey Farms... Oh my goodness, there were so many of them. They were the, they were two of the, the largest clients that I had. They did more of that style commercial. That's how it started out. And I was a pioneer. I had nobody to ask. Like, all right, for instance, I got the copy from the copywriter at uh, Doing Advertising Agents agency for Jersey Farms. This was featuring whipped cream. How do you put whipped cream under those lights for the camera to get your picture? It deflated immediately. So I trial and error, trial and error, on all of it, everything I did, I had to think, how can I enhance it? Because you just take that product and show it, it was not anything spectacular. I very much recall the strawberry shortcake with the whipped cream piled high. However, it was shaving cream, and it held up wonderfully under the lights. Unfortunately, Ralph Christian, who was doing the news that evening, I was at 6 o'clock there at WSM live, in the kitchen area, which was right beside the control room. And I had noticed very many, very often that uh, whoever the announcer was for the six o'clock news, they waited until the last minute and then rushed in the control room and did their bit and left, you know. So I was there and had just finished the commercial right beside the control room. And there sat my strawberry shortcake with supposedly the whipped cream piled high. Well, Ralph came by in a hurry, swiped that whipped cream with his hand and put it in his mouth. I'll never forget it. Oh, my gosh. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen. But he got himself straight and did the news and then came out and really... (laughs) was upset with, of course he wasn't really, but acted upset with us because we made such a to-do and laughed about it so much. But 
Anyway, there were crazy things that happened. Oh, my gosh. Whew, live television. Kroger. Did Kroger. Had Kroger. That was one of the clients. They had a meat that was called Tenderay back then. And, see, on this table where the cameras, of course, uh, panned over the table, it was not just, it was not just the thing that you were showing. You did a beautiful table that was a lot a larger shot. And then they came in on the uh, particular thing that they, they were introducing that night. Well, the table was set and I always had flowers and, you know, candelabra and whatever to make it a beautiful table. And that night it was a roast and I showed the roast finished which you know I had it was not even cooked but it had oil with red food coloring in it and I don't know but it looked glazed and it was beautiful and it looked done and then I had the other roast that was cooked that I was to show how easily you could cut it because it was so tender well I had my knife that was sharpened and I was on life <laughs> and I took that knife and I was trying to cut that roast and I was looking at the teleprompter and I could see the veins protruding in my wrist because I was bearing down so hard it wouldn't cut the meat and finally it just jumped off the table <laughs> oh my goodness oh my goodness and then one night <laughs> That was Jersey Farms. It was to show it, the thing that was featured was chocolate milk that comes in a carton, cold chocolate milk, okay? How many ways you can use it and how it can be wonderful hot chocolate with marshmallow, you know, melting in it. Okay, I got to the studio that night and there was a political thing going on in the studio and that's where the refrigerator was, and that's where I did all my work. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? So immediately one of the boys had been looking out to see when I got there and told me to come to the back. that They had set up uh, Judge News in the stock room and my table for the commercial on the news. And I walked in, and, you know, I finished the table and all that, and uh, I took the cold milk to pour into... Not a stove, but they had set up a hot plate. Well, I didn't know the hot plate was plugged in. The stock boy that set it up thought he was doing the right thing, I'm sure. So he plugged the hot plate in. And on top of that was the Pyrex pan that had been sitting there getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Things were going well. I was watching the teleprompter, and <laughs> I poured that cold milk in that hot Pyrex pan, and it exploded on the air. Black smoke filled the screen. <laughs> and Mr. Doan, who was my employer, was a man that was well known for expecting perfection. And it was not, it was not difficult for him to let you go. He had the reputation, <laughs> I knew it. And we all thought, you know, after that, I'd probably be fired from doing advertising agency. Well, sure enough, we were all standing there just dying laughing. And uh, the girl up front uh, had answered the phone. She came back to the studio, back to the prop room, and she said, Mary, the phone, somebody wants you on the phone. And, of course, we all said, well, that's it. It's George Doan. And I got to the phone, and when I picked the phone up, all I could hear was this laughter. He said, well, Mary Williams, you put Jersey Farms on the, on the minds of people for a long time. And he said, after all, that's what we're, that's what we're after. Mrs. Williams worked in television for 10 years, deciding to stop to have her fourth child. 
Given today's news of sexual harassment in the entertainment industry, I asked her if she had ever encountered any such problems. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the, I mean, I, were, I was so shocked because I was so, you know, in my world, all I knew were gentlemen. I didn't know other people. Now, I'm not going to say that, that I couldn't be taken advantage of, but I never was. It was so cute one night. Judd Collins. Do you remember Judd Collins at all? No, the no, name is familiar. So yeah, I'm yeah, I'm 53. Yeah. So. Oh, well, he was he was the gentleman. He was such a gentleman. And he was an uh, uh, anchor man. Yeah, at, with WSM for years and years. And and one night uh, I was there by myself, and I had was waiting to do a commercial. I don't know whether this guy was drinking or not. I don't know, but. Uh, Judd was in the studio, and I was in the studio, and I was over in the kitchen area. And I don't know what possessed this man, but he just got real, I don't know, (laughs) you know, wanted to hug you. I didn't even know him. And I just started around the table, and he started after me. And Judd saw it, and he came over to the table. He said, "Uh, sir, I don't know what you're thinking, But he said, I would sure hate for her husband to walk in. He said, he is a big man. And (laughs) I think if I were you, I I would watch myself. And I thought, you know, what a difference. What a difference. Judd was their gentleman, and then their, I detested. I absolutely detested. Mary B. Williams got the big family she wanted, ending up with five children, the first and last born 24 years apart. The Williamses spent most of their time in Inglewood, but in the last years of her husband's life, they moved to Green Hills so he could be closer to their children. Mrs. Williams is proud of her East Nashville roots. My husband and I went to a dinner that my brother, who wasn't in East Nashville after he became a well-known attorney and made oodles of money, and he was a wonderful man, and I adored him, but we lived a different lifestyle. I mean, you know, we just did, but we were like this. We had grown up 16 months apart, and we remained very, very close. So I was invited to all of his parties, and among the last ones, (laughs) we went, my husband and I went, and, uh, and we were seated with a couple from, uh, Belmede, Jackson Boulevard, okay? Uh, you know, you get to talking. I mean, it's not, it's very easy for me to talk to new people because I love meeting new people. I do. And we were sitting there and she told me that they lived on Jackson Boulevard. And I said, well, I'm from East Nashville. And she said, uh, now, she wasn't new to Nashville. That's what was, that was the, she said, East Nashville. Where is East Nashville? I said, oh, you know, the river divides Nashville. We're on the west side here. If you cross the river, you're on the east side. So that's East Nashville. She said, I don't think I've ever been to East Nashville. <laughs> My husband kicked me for me to shut up. <laughs> under the table because he knew what I was going to do. But I said, I did. I said, oh, well, you ought to visit us sometime. I said, it's a lovely area. <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, that's the way people felt, and they still do. They still do. Mrs. Williams's love of Nashville and its history led to yet a third career. She started a successful tour guide company in 1979. She's seen a lot of changes in Nashville, particularly in the downtown area. I have not many friends left, of course, because at 94, I've lost so many of my old friends. Well, I've lost all but one. And the newer friends that I've made uh, are not particularly interested in downtown. And I am. To see what is happening in downtown is thrilling to me. Now, I know that the old scenes, the things that were so familiar, are gone. But the new things are wonderful. 
And I, I am a firm believer, even with a person, a business, whatever, you don't stand still. You either go back or you go forward. And I am so pleased that Nashville is going forward. And it's thrilling to me where my younger friends don't care for it at all. They don't like the traffic. <laughs> they don't go downtown. And it's just, it's just a difference in how you feel about the city. And I love it. I love Nashville with a passion. Our thanks to Mary B. Williams for the interview. If you would like to read more of her stories, look for her forthcoming book, My Cup Runneth Over, slated to be available at Amazon.com. Francis Craig serenades with Red Rose. listening to a record that made Nashville a mecca in the recording industry. That was Red Rose, the A-side of the record, and actually, it's not so famous. It was the B-side that would go on to make history. If you're a fan of this podcast, you've heard that famous B-side before, even though only two people have ever told me they recognized it. The dramatic piano music we use as an intro is from a song called Near You, and it was composed and recorded by a man named Francis Craig. Francis Craig was a um, big band leader in Nashville, and Nashville was really a, a dance band town in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Uh, and he had uh, one of the top, if not the top, uh, dance band, certainly white dance band, for a number of years. Don Cusick is the Kerr Professor of Music Industry History at Belmont University, and he's written numerous books on music history. He was uh, uh, regular at, uh, at the Hermitage, played every weekend there, had uh, radio shows, had, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was a very big local star. Uh, this was the era of the big band leaders being stars. Donia Dickerson, Francis Craig's daughter, remembered her father writing the music for the recording that would change Nashville. She recounted the story in an interview with Ken Berryhill on Vanderbilt's radio station, WRVU. Near You was written at 202 Hillwood Drive in 1945 uh, on a Sunday night. I believe it was a Sunday night. I know that there were more times that Daddy uh, arranged, uh, uh, did his arranging and all, but he literally, to use his term, whipped up Near You. And I remember a friend of mine, Lillian Dobson Donovan, who now lives in Memphis, was spending the night with me. And the next morning, he said, now, girls, I've got a little tune here I want to play for you, and I want you to tell me if you think it's a good tune. And that little tune he whipped up, Ken, was, was I ever famous near you, the song that Nashville is to this day proud of. At the time, Craig was retired from performing live shows, and he was working for WSM as a disc jockey and librarian. But he wanted to record a song called Red Rose, which was his theme song. So a label had just started named Bullet Records. Uh, it's pretty amazing that in 1945, uh, there wasn't a single record label or recording studio in Nashville. And, and, you know, 15 years later, we're Music City, USA. And really what kicks it off is a session in January of 47. We had uh, some engineers had, uh, from the WSM had started a studio, the Castle Recording Studio, a group of musicians uh, led by Francis Craig go in there, uh, and they record uh, three songs. They have or time enough for one song left, uh, and they decide to do um, uh, Near You. 
nobody thought too much of it. It was on the B side of the record, and uh, a radio station in Georgia started playing it. It just took off, and that really puts Nashville on the map. It's kind of forgotten today, but it puts, you know, here's a million seller coming out of Nashville in a Nashville studio with a Nashville-based independent label. Near You became a post-war sensation, selling millions of the 78 RPM single. Eventually, Milton Berle would even use the music as a theme song for his TV show. Near You is one of the weirdest records i've ever heard <laughs> they like they were liking this piano part somebody did i think francis craig did and so it starts with this piano just banging away and then it goes into this 1940s pop type type song uh there's just one da, 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 you know? <laughs> and then it finishes that and goes back to that piano banging away <laughs> it, is, it is one of the weirdest songs of all uh, weirdest records of all time stay tuned after the end of this episode to hear more of near you from francis craig's personal copy of the record which is held in a collection at the nashville public library as for the lyrics the story goes that craig ran into a colleague at the grill room in the hermitage hotel and asked him to write the lyrics even though the guy didn't care much for the tune he jotted down some lyrics on a menu. The, the guy who wrote the lyrics, Kermit Gould, uh, was living in Nashville when, uh, when I moved to town. He was kind of living in his car, had an old dog, and he had fallen on hard times. But he had written the lyrics to it and thought it was just you know a dumb song and didn't really pay much attention to it uh, until it becomes a big hit. Near You may have been the start of Music City, USA, but it was not the start of music here. In his latest book, Nashville Sound, an illustrated timeline, Don Cusick surveys the full history of music in Nashville. It covers Nashville music and musicians from, uh, it really starts with the Fifth Jubilee Singers uh, in the 19th century, but uh, I, you know, I go back a little further with Davy Crockett playing the fiddle and the Taylor Brothers, who both ran for... Uh, uh, governor at the same time and you know would, would uh, fiddle after they had uh, made their uh, speeches but it really answers the question of uh, how did nashville become music city usa uh, i think that's that's the gist of it and it's not just one thing it's uh it's a lot of things a lot of factors and a lot of different music our thanks to the nashville public library for access to the francis craig papers and to don cusick for the interview Thank you for listening to this episode of Nashville Retrospect. For more information about the stories you heard, including photographs and links, see the show notes on the podcast webpage, which you can find a link to at nashvilleretrospect.com. You can also email your comments and suggestions to nashretroshow at gmail.com. This show was written and produced by me, Alan Forkham. Stay tuned for the next one. And in the meantime, don't forget to pick up your copy of the Nashville Retrospect.
just one place for me near you. It's like heaven to be near you. Times when we're apart, I can't fix my heart. Yeah.